I'm on a mission like a couple spies, and that guys is the reason why I catechize. The good- Welcome to the Reform Standard. I'm Tony. Let's get started. We're going to take a little break from our series on the Westminster Larger Catechism to review um, once in a while some other confessional uh, doctrinal statements that have helped to shape the Reformed tradition. So today we're going to talk about uh, chapter one of the Scots Confession or the Scottish Confession. So this is uh, this is a confession that most Reformed people probably have not spent a lot of time studying. But um, this was kind of a precursor to the Westminster Confession of Faith and the um, associated catechisms. And so the, the Scottish Church in 1560 drafted up this confession um, in order to articulate what they believed. And so we're going to go through chapters 1 and 2 uh, before we go back to the Westminster Confession, um, because chapters 1 and 2 of the Scots Confession cover a lot of the same ground that we've already talked about. So chapter 1 uh, is titled, Of God. And it reads, we confess and acknowledge one only God to whom only we must cleave, whom only we must serve, whom only we must worship, and in whom only we must put our trust, who is eternal, infinite, immeasurable, incomprehensible, omnipotent, invisible, one in substance, yet distinct in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, by whom we confess and believe all things in heaven and earth, as well as visible as invisible to have been created, to be retained in their being, and to be ruled and guided by his inscrutable providence. To such end his eternal wisdom, goodness and justice hath appointed them to the manifestation of his own glory. So this this chapter, um, as you would surmise from the um, the title, is basically the Scottish Confession's articulation of the, the doctrine of theology proper. So this covers the same uh, ground that we covered in the Nicene Creed series we did a little bit ago. And it also starts to cover some of the stuff we've been talking about in um, the, the most recent questions on creation, the decrees, and providence. So one of the things that's a little bit different um, in, in this than we've seen some other articulations is this actually bakes in um, some ethical implications into this. So not only do we confess in the Scots Confession that there's one God, but we confess that uh, to him we must cleave, to him we must serve, him we must worship, and him we must put our trust. So they're, they're baking in some of this ob- obligatory worship, some of the, the obedience that's due to God as our creator, um, which the Westminster catechisms, uh, put later in, in their section on the, uh, the 10 commandments and sort of the ethical teaching of the the catechisms. So it's important to recognize this because, um, the reformed have always understood that because God is God, because God is our redeemer, because God is the Lord, that we owe him certain uh, certain obedience and certain um, duties that are required. The church as a whole has always recognized this, but the the uh, reformed have really tried to bring it back to the forefront of their theology and, and associate it with theology proper in a, a different way. So even though the Westminster Catechisms uh, wait to bring this information into uh, into play until later in the catechisms, they're still it's still tied to who God is the, as the reason and why we obey him. So our relationship to him is not something that um, comes about exclusively by covenant, right? Because God is God, um, because he is the creator, because he is the Lord, we are obligated to serve and obey him. Um, the covenant of works uh, is then added to that later, um, later, logically, you know, Adam was created and given the covenant of works probably in one single act. But but it's added logically subsequent that even though we owe him obedience, there's still this covenant that's made. So then the Scots Confession here goes on to articulate many of the same, um, all of the same kinds of things that we talked about in theology proper, eternal, infinite, immeasurable, incomprehensible, omnipotent, and invisible. Um, I don't remember if we talked about incomprehensible in the last uh, discussion of this, but the incomprehensibility of God is another one of those things that the church on, on different levels in different parts of her history has always affirmed. 
uh, really until you get to sort of the liberal revolution or the lib- the, the the age of enlightenment um, coming after the Reformation, did the incomprehensibility of God start to be called into question. And this doesn't mean we can't understand anything about God, but as the word would suggest, it means we can't fully comprehend, we can't get our head all the way around uh, God and who he is and what his attributes are. Um, the confession then goes on to articulate a fairly standard um, uh, doctrine of the Trinity, that God is one substance, um, but there is never a God apart from the three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, and then and then here it, it goes on to articulate, you know, a confession about creation, that God created all things. Um, he, it uses this series, uh, these two merisms, which we talked about in the Nicene Creed series. And then it goes on and starts to talk about providence, which we haven't quite gotten to. But the providence of God, this is tied into the doctrine of sovereignty and, and how it is that God controls all things uh, and, and ordains all things and brings all things to be without necessarily being uh, the originator or the author of sin and evil in the world. And it says that all things that have been created are retained in their being. And so we'll talk about this when we get to this point in, in the catechism, but God sustains all things. And so anything that happens, um, happens because God has chosen to allow it to happen. Even if simply by the fact that he has allowed and has intentionally, uh, re- retained the being of, of the sinner or the, um, the physical force that has caused the, the calamity. And so the doctrine of providence is not just about God controlling things. It's not even primarily about God controlling things. It's really about God um, sustaining all things. And, and uh, you know, in him, uh, we live and move and have our being. In Christ, all things hold together. So the Bible is very clear that the, the ongoing existence of all reality is sustained and is is determined by the fact that God's God has willed to retain that. And, and then in the end here, it connects it to, um, to a, a couple different reasons why he does that. He does it according to his wisdom, his goodness, and his justice. And these things unfold according to those things because he has appointed them to do so. And then finally, it affirms, as the Reformed have always affirmed, and we'll see this again and again, is that all things that come to pass, whether good or evil, whether positive or negative, whether pleasurable or painful, all things come to pass, all things remain in being, because they manifest the glory of God. You know, if you want, you could know this. The catechism, hey, the catechism, hey. Do you know what the chief and the man is? And how the Father, Son, and Spirit do manage? Do you know if you want, you could know this? West Side.